For Americans, the Second World War began just before 8 o'clock, December 7th, 1941. It lasted three years, eight months, and 28 days. For 1,423 days, Americans fought and died in the six million square miles of the Pacific. They stormed unnamed beaches. They fought their way through jungles and swamps. And the names of far-off islands became commonplace words in the news of that day. Names such as Guadalcanal, the Russells, Munda, Rendova, Vela La Vela, and Bougainville. The tides of war came, but in time passed over. Those islands and those beaches, what are they like today? Well, I want you to meet our in-person guest. His name is Miles Hinshaw, and he's just returned from an extensive assignment for us throughout the Solomon Islands to capture this story. Miles, you want to tell us about it? Bill, this was a most interesting trip for me. Uh, I went into the Solomon Islands with a man by the name of Martin Clemens. In 1941, Clemens was the district officer on Guadalcanal of the British Solomon Islands Protectorate. And when the Japanese invaded, instead of fleeing the island like many others had done, he stayed there. He went up into the mountains, taking with him several native boys and uh, armed with nothing more than 303 rifles and a radio. And due to his efforts and other men like him who had done the same thing on different other islands in the Solomon chain, uh, they formed a, a unit called the Coast Watchers and became the eyes and ears of the Allies, uh, informing them of Japanese ship movements and uh, Japanese troop movements and building activities going on on the various islands. They told the Allies that the Japanese were building a big airfield on Guadalcanal, which later became the famous Henderson Field. And because of this information, the Allied command decided to change their original invasion uh, plans and come in on Guadalcanal as a first step on the long road back. I was privileged to come back to Guadalcanal with Martin Clemens. He hadn't been there since the war. Two decades had passed. And revisit those spots and meet those people who had been so important to him at this time in his life and see these things through his own eyes. Bill, we're on our way now, back to the South Pacific. Down below stretch the thousands of islands and reefs that make up the British Solomon Islands. Tiny dots of land that lay forgotten by the rest of the world until World War II. And then, in the span of a few short months, such names as Munda, Rendova, Vela La Vela, Guadalcanal, and Bougainville became household words as American troops worked their way up the Solomons in bitter jungle fighting against the embattled forces of Imperial Japan. After a long and tiresome flight from Australia, Guadalcanal finally looms up out of its tropical cloud cover, and the once weekly flight lands on Henderson Field. Guadalcanal today is peaceful. The only sign of the savage conflict that took place here are a few pieces of rusted debris that dot the beaches and jungle. The high humidity, constant rain and heat have made short work of what few pieces of equipment are still left at the canal. Still they serve as grim reminders of the savage conflict that raged here over two decades ago. It was here at the canal that I first met Martin Clemens, Bill. Now Martin was the district officer on Guadalcanal when the Japanese occupied it in 1941. Only instead of fleeing the island, Clemens went into the jungle and gathering some native police boys around him, formed a guerrilla army to harass the Japanese and radio their activities to the American forces. And now, after an absence of 20 years, he had returned to revisit the Solomons, to see the places, and again meet the people who formed the most important part of his life. Well, thanks to the excellent cooperation afforded us by His Excellency, Sir David Trench, the High Commissioner of the Solomons, we boarded his ship, the Coral Queen, for the start of our nostalgic journey. Leaving from Point Cruz, we passed out of the harbor 
and headed west following the shoreline of Guadalcanal. A few miles away is Savo Island, the site of the Battle of Iron Bottom Bay, where the United States Navy suffered one of its worst defeats in history at the hands of the Japanese. Another historic spot we passed was Cape Esperance, where the Japanese forces were finally driven from the island. Aboard the ship with us was a group of Gilbertese natives, Bill. They were on their way from Guadalcanal to their village on the island of Gizo, and the melodic sound of their native music certainly made the long trip pass more quickly. Finally, we steamed into the harbor at Yandina in the Russell Islands. Although the Russells were spared the horrors of war, they served as an important supply and staging base for our drive up the Solomon Chain. During the war, the Russells were a scene of immense amounts of military activity. Huge air bases were constructed here, as well as rest camps, supply depots, and ammunition dumps. Now, it's an island that thousands of ex-GIs will remember well with uh, mixed emotions. Today, the Russells have recovered from the rigors of war, and once again, the business of growing coconuts is in full swing, and every available piece of cleared land is filled with their swaying palms. Still cutting a swath through their stately trunks is the runway of the Banica airfield, except today, instead of roaring fighters and bombers taking off, the only sound is that of a lonely Volkswagen. During our visit to the Russells, we visited one of Lever Brothers' plantations, Copra is the main commodity of the Solomons, and most of the war-torn trees have been replaced with seedlings like these. A new innovation instituted by Lieber Brothers is a herd of cattle to keep down the underbrush, which grows quickly in the tropics. While most of the military installations have given away to the rigors of time, one can still find a few ruins, such as this rotted and decayed PT boat base on Banica Island. What stories these ruins could tell, could they only speak? Still on Benica, we visited the site of a military equipment dump being uncovered by British salvage men. And here they're digging out a fortune in abandoned trucks, trailers, sheet iron, Quonset huts, and yes, thousands upon thousands of cases of Coca-Cola. Amazingly enough, it's still capped and drinkable. A little flat, but when you're thirsty, it's, it's passable. Typical of the type of equipment left behind in buried dumps is this four-wheeled heavy-duty trailer now being used by Lever Brothers to transport loads of copra to the loading dock. Literal fortunes have been made in the salvage field, Bill. Here we see natives salvaging slugs from a buried small arms dump. These bits and pieces of brass, lead, and copper are dug out by hand, then they're placed in gunny sacks, and finally packed away in salvaged 50-gallon oil drums. And then they'll be shipped to Japan or Hong Kong as scrap iron. occasional Japanese freighter pulls into port, you'll find the docks weighted down with this valuable cargo of scrap metal, 
destined for the ports of Asia. And as I viewed this scene, I couldn't help wonder if this very same metal would ever find its way back to being used against us in some future conflict. Well, on the lighter side, the British have found that abandoned American airfields make excellent golf courses. And here on Benica, as well as on Guadalcanal and Munda, the British have converted runways to fairways, complete with sand traps and all of the usual accessories of an American country club. We're on our way again, Bill, heading east towards New Georgia and Munda. This area is typically South Seas with colored reefs, blue water, and jungle green islands dotting the water's surface. And finally in the distance we see Munda. And Martin Clements was anxious now, for here he was to meet several of his old scouts, men he hadn't seen for over 20 years. What thoughts were going through his mind in these moments before landing, I don't know. But moving moments they were indeed. For these were men who at great peril to their own lives had devotedly served him and the Allied cause well. For without the help of these native coast watchers and guides, the American campaign in the Solomons might easily have failed. It was quite a sight, Bill, these old soldiers, comrades in arms, reliving their days of glory. This man was Clemens Sargent, blind and lame now, and I think he expressed his feelings best of all as he told Martin, I have waited 20 years to meet you again and shake your hand, and now that I have seen you once again, I can die. Twenty years after the Solomon campaigns, Bill, but the natives haven't forgotten. The deeds of our service men have become legends now, told in the folk songs of the islands. This one tells of an American Marine capturing a Japanese machine gun nest. I've heard it said that old soldiers don't cry, but there were tears in the eyes of Martin Clemens as we pulled away from Munda and headed for our last rendezvous with the past, the island of Gizo. During most of the war, Giza was Japanese occupied. It's currently famous for one reason. It's the closest place of human habitation to where John F. Kennedy's men went down in the PT-109. Yes, only a few short miles from this Japanese-held island, President Kennedy and his crew hid in fear of capture by the Japanese forces that were located here. Many of those who served as rescuers to Kennedy and his crew still live in this area. This man is one of those and goes by the name of Benjamin. He was one of the men who risked his life to bring the PT-109 crew to safety after they were discovered hiding on an offshore island now named Plum Pudding Island. His greatest thrill was when he was flown from his Solomon Island home to the United States for a television appearance a few months ago. It was the first time in his life that he had ever been away from his island home. This man's name is Aaron, and he too wielded a skillful paddle during the Kennedy rescue effort. In hand-hewed dugouts like this one, these loyal coast watchers rescued countless Americans from sure capture by the Japanese. Two other men who were instrumental in the Kennedy rescue are Byuku Gasa, who first found Kennedy and carried the message written on a coconut to the authorities. And John Carey, headman of the village, who organized the rescue operation of the PT-109 crew from Plum Pudding Island 
this tiny spot of land where Kennedy and his crew swam to safety after their torpedo boat was cut in two by a Japanese destroyer. We were fortunate, Bill, to obtain an interview between John Kerry and Martin Clements relating to the Kennedy rescue efforts. Your name is? My name is Johnny Kerry. Right. You were a coast watcher with Mr. Evans on Kulumbanga. Yes. Now, I'm bringing uh, Mr. Kennedy. You saw Mr. Kennedy? Yes, sir. And he was on an island? I'm bringing Bill Coon and Aaron. Yes. I'll go with the PT boat and go to Naru and pick up Mr. Kennedy there. Yes. But after that, we go through in the passage of Naru. Now we go get the crew of Mr. Kennedy there. After that, we bring them to Randall Island again, where the base of the uh, PT there. Mr. Kennedy very sunburnt? Yes, Mr. Kennedy very sunburnt. And hungry? Hungry. And we pick up him. Was he glad you picked him up? We pick up him and he's very glad. And we are also very glad too. Oh, yes. How many of the crew did you pick up? Ten of the crews. Ten of the crew. And Mr. Kennedy's message was written on a coconut? Yes, yes, sir. And Mr. Kennedy, keep that coconut now? Mr. Kennedy, keep, uh, keep the skin of the coconut now. Oh, yes. And were you surprised when you heard he was president? No. Uh, now I'm very surprised him to hear him hear the he is our president now. I'm very surprised now. You and think he makes a good one? No, I'm very glad to hear. Yes. He is a very important man now. You want to send a message to him? No, I wanted to send my message to him. And the love of the Solomon Island to him. Good. Would you like to go to America and see him sometime? Or if he wants me, or I can go to America to see him. You prefer him to come here and see you? If he comes to Solomon Island, I will see him too. Yes. Another interesting place we visited during our journey through the Solomons was this Gilbertese village, Tishiana. This is an experimental program, Bill, of moving people from overpopulated Gilbert Islands to the Solomons with little population. Tishiana is a model village and has been in existence for a couple of years with apparent success. Unlike the dark-skinned Melanesians, the Gilbertese are fair-skinned, called Micronesians, and have managed to integrate nicely into the new way of life in the Solomon Islands. Still, they cling to the old ways, the old dances, the only apparent concession to civilization being a set of T-shirts which the girls wear when dancing before outsiders like ourselves. servicemen who fought in the vicious battles of Tarawa and Macon will remember these people as being a friendly and warm-hearted group. And these attributes still remain today.
These are the Solomons today, Bill, a quiet, peaceful group of islands basking in the tropical sun. They're off the beaten path, many of them primitive or even uninhabited. But the world changes, and the people of the Solomons will, within the next few years, be thrown into the turmoil of independence. For around them, there's progress and change, and their peaceful existence will once more be disrupted, this time by growing pains of nationalism and independence. For many, the Solomon Islands are a land of wartime memories. But for me, they're a land of true adventure. Milas, I think you've brought our viewers a most exciting and fascinating story and most nostalgic, too. How about the, the natives of the Solomon Islands? You know, uh, you hear much about uh, how people feel about Americans mm -hmm. and soldiers, sailors, and Marines. How, how do they feel about uh, our people and our soldiers 20 years after the war? Oh, Bill, they have the highest regards uh, for the Americans. I don't know what the XGIs did down there, but boy, they, they have sold the natives uh, on the uh, people of the United States. Matter of fact, there's an organization called the Marching Rule, which uh, gives the British government quite a bit of trouble because it's, they're like, it's like waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Uh, they're waiting for the day when uh, ships will come sailing over the horizon, loaded down with refrigerators and ice cream, and especially American Marines. They uh, really have taken a great liking to them. Seems to me we called them gee dunks in the old days, <laughs> ice cream and so on. You know, I joined the Navy, of course, after uh, the war had started, but I think I was in on a destroyer, and I remember one battle in particular that we all spoke about was the Battle of Savo Island, which was a most terrifying naval engagement. It cost uh, many thousands of American lives and Japanese lives. What was your feeling as you sailed across this, this sea? What they, they call it Iron Bottom Bay. Yes. Oh, it's uh, quiet and peaceful now. It's, uh, the whole area, you can't believe it when you go back. Uh, the only signs are a few rusted pieces of equipment. Everything's very peaceful now. Well, I think, too, there's a thing that people always are interested in. Do you suppose, by any chance, that since many of these islands are remote, that there might be some Japanese who have lived on after the war since they were cut off and perhaps still there, hidden in the jungle somewhere? Well, this is uh, something that interested me, too. I think this is a very interesting story. Uh, the chances are that there isn't because of the malaria and the heat and so forth, but the natives down there insist that uh, they're always coming in with stories that they found a cave and it's loaded down with rice and sake and uh, all of the uh, things that you might uh, think a Japanese soldier might have in the jungle. And uh, they, they're convinced that there is Japanese still around. And it could be, uh, for instance, on Guam in 1960, they caught two Japanese. Wireless Hinshaw, we want to thank you for coming on the program you, and Bill. telling us this fascinating story. And ladies and gentlemen, we, we hope you enjoyed sharing more or less uh, a page in American history. The, the story of what our men did in those days will, we hope, live forever in the annals of uh, American history, and we sure it will. Until we meet once again, this is Bill Bird saying, God bless you, and goodbye.